Welcome to the core activity doc and in this section we'll be covering the IFRS okay so which is the uh, international financial reporting standard. Now remember the IFRS what we need to cover is that it will be related to the case related to a pricing company. We are not particularly interested in things like conceptual framework. We are not particularly interested in who sets the IFRS, for example, up to the IFRS Foundation and up to the IASB to set up the IFRS. So this is why we'll be covering each of the IFRS in turn. The first accounting standard is according to the International Accounting Standards Number 2 Inventory. Okay, so the IFRS, of course, the previous standard, still exists, we call them as the IAS. But the latest IFRS, unless we replace the new standard from the old one, of course, we'll be using the name called IFRS. Now, if you're not particularly sure about the number in the IFRS, don't quote it. But rather, you should say, per IFRS, Inventory. Instead of saying to the examining team, this is according to the IFRS number 2 inventory, because IFRS 2 is all about the share based payment, it's not about inventory at all. So, no need to close the number if you're not particularly sure about that. Now, related to inventory, the sort of questions that may be examined would be including the general rule. And also the cost valuation, for example, using first in, first out, or the weighted average. And the inventory write-off, which means the damaging to inventories, and we need to reduce this value to a net realisable value. Now, how we think about the IES2 inventory would be this. Firstly, inventory is something that the business holds in order to sell it. So this means that I think the aim for that will be to sell in the ordinary course of business. But you don't really have to quote the exact same word as I mentioned before in your exam, because this is not an open book exam. So most likely that you need to say to the examining team that the aim of inventory is held to be sold. Now, of course, we buy the inventory inside the business, we'll be using the historical costs method. So, historical costs, which means according to your purchase price. So the purchase price, if you determine that would be $100, you simply increase the purchases or inventories account and to credit cash. But there are maybe some of the trade discount, which means uh, if you buy this inventory, you can get 20% off discount. So what we need to do is to account for $80 as the net price as the inventory value in our financial statement. That's very important there. Other costs, for example, the installation costs, for example, that we buy the inventory, but uh, we will need to install it, okay, in our warehouse to fit into a particular machine. So the installation cost that we pay, and also the delivery cost that we need to pay, let's say total at $60, so we need to include them in the inventory account, worth of $140. One thought is what I mean by historical cost method. So it seems to me that we need to capitalise the 140 as the inventory value in our account. So this is the first time, this is the first time that we get the inventory and technically we can call it as the initial measurement. But in the OCS exam, there's no need to quote those technical words because you will get the same marks 
even though you say that this is the first time so we purchase the inventory and we need to put the 140 uh, to the inventory value but technically from your SEMA F1 study before you may be saying that we need to capitalize the 140 and to debit purchases and credit cash but in the OCS exam you're required to explain things there's no need for you to say these technical stuff of course later on I would say that later on but in technical terms it's called subsequent measurement now later on you will need to determine the cost value and the net realizable value and that's very important there to determine that cost value of course we can either use the first in first out and perhaps weighted average cost method especially is that you keep buying inventories inside your business and each and every time that you bought the same item the price will be quite different so when you sell one of those inventories to a customer you need to measure profit you take the selling price and to subtract costs of that inventory but which cost that you need to use if you're using first in first out which means that the item I bought Thursday we need to check that cost and use that cost to calculate the profit where we sell the item to a final customer that's what I mean by first in first out weighted average cost on the other hand simply means that each and every time that we purchase the, purchase the item of inventory we will need to recalculate that cost and we use that cost to calculate the profit net realizable value on the other hand is just to be the accounting estimate it's just to be the estimate made by management so all we need to do is to take the estimated selling price and to minus the estimated costs in order to complete the sale so for example according to a company's pricing list that the price that we sell the item of inventory usually at $80 but in order to complete the sale we will also need to pay the commission fee to our sales staff let's say worth of $15 so 80 minus 15 the net realizable value which means we can realize 65 that we estimated is the cash to the business because we are using the historical cost method here in the ice number two inventories so we are using the concept of net realizable value to see how much value that we can cover our costs because if you're operating on a not a breakup basis but on an ongoing basis which means under a going concern assumption the business has to make profit and this is why usually the net realizable value will be much higher than the costs so you can make profit from it however if the inventory is damaged for example that the cost is much higher than net realizable value so this means that the inventory is damaged or becoming obsolete so what you need to do you need to tell the examining team that you need to write off the inventory value to the net realizable value or NRV for short so I believe that all these bits and pieces can help you pass this standard okay in the OCS exam because in the OCS exam when a particular accounting standard came up it will not account for approximately 50-60% of the total question but possibly 30-40% to only now if you're using my 12 paragraphs principle it times by 30 or 40% approximately three to four paragraphs that you can make 
If you're not sure about the eye advice, if you can't write three to four paragraphs, I suppose at least you can write two. So you can't fail this part, pass it. But don't be perfect on that. Because I specialize in teaching the eye advice. If you want me to teach the eyes two inventories to you, I can spend two to three hours covering all the aspects in the standard. But in the OCS exam, the examining team is never interested in those, but requires students to have a basic understanding of the accounting standards, and this will be absolutely nothing there. Of course, you can further say in the inventory, yes, we include raw materials, work in progress, finished goods items. Uh, so the inventories, when we determine that inventory, if it is not for retailer, but it's for manufacturer, we also consider the overhead. We need to calculate the overhead absorption rate based on the normal capacity okay, of our, in, within our business. Well, you don't really have to learn all of them, really. Now, um, I've summarised a few model answers, or the pre-learned paragraph for you. Now, firstly, the inventory value at the lower of cost and net realisable value, and that's important. And it includes the purchase price, that kind of stuff, excluding trade discount. And, of course, overhead can sometimes be included, if you are the manufacturer rather than the retailer who buys inventory at low price and without any sort of manufacturing work later on but aims to sell it at a higher price. Now, sort of cost that should be expensed rather than putting into the inventory value, for example, the abnormal wastes. Okay, so. Uh, which means the abnormal loss of the inventory and general storage costs, if you can remember that. And how we calculate the net realisable value, we take the expected selling price minus in costs to sale. So that's important there. Now, you can see a particular question, for example here, that how the damage to the finished good will affect our financial statement. Okay. So he's talking about here, damage. The first conclusion that I can tell the examining team is that we need to write off the inventory value to NRV. That would be my first point. Second point, it really depending on whether or not the damage to inventory will really result in the inventory cannot be sold to others. So in this case, the NRV will certainly be zero because there will be no expected selling price, okay, if the inventory damage is so severe. And therefore, we need to fully write off the inventory value. And the third paragraph, you can say to the examining team that this is according to the accounting standards requirements, the law of cost and NRV. And further, you can say that how it determines the NRV in this case, to take the estimated selling price and to minus the estimated cost of sale. Uh, if you say those things, of course you will score the full marks, okay? Uh, do we need to closely relate solve requirements to the pre -Z? The answer for that would be absolutely no. Do we need to relate that back to the unseen material? Well, the answer for that is, it really depends. For example, you can say that what sort of finished good that the case is talking about, you can change that name. And no more than that. And the damage, how it damages the inventory, whether or not it's been stolen by somebody else, or damaged by sort of bad weather, so for example, flood or fire. So that's how we relate that to the case. Okay, so if you spend lots of time reading through and to planning how my answer can be related back to the unseen exhibit. No need to do that in the OCS exam only. But of course, in the MCS management case and the strategic case study later on, 
I highly suggest you to relate your answer closely to the case. But I will teach you in subsequent stages. Moving on. Another accounting standard is the IAS number 10. It meant after the reporting period. So this means that when we account for the transactions, so usually this year, for example, year one, we will bring the event and even different transactions, for example, the sales revenue and purchases in our current year's account. However, if events happening after the year end, we will need to think about the event after the current year end, whether or not we should bring those in our year one's account or in a year two's account. So it really depending on whether or not Thursday events will be happening between the year end up to financial statement being authorised to issue to shareholders. If it means happening within this period, of course, we will need to see whether or not it has a cause and effect relationship with the transactions happening in the year one. So if the answer for that is yes, we call them as adjusting event. Now, adjusting event, you don't really have to quote the definition for that because the exact quote from the IS number 10 would be that it meant after the reporting period, if it provides evidence existed at the reporting date, that these will be adjusting event. So what we need to do is to adjust the transaction, which means we need to put the double entries in, which means debit and credit something. And we need to reflect this in the year one's account, although the event happening in year two. If it does not provide evidence existed at the year end, we treat them as non-adjusting event. So which means that we only disclose the event in the year one's account. And of course, we will adjust that in the year two when the event happened. But you don't really have to quote them. My view is this. In this exam, you will need to see in the exhibit information if after the reporting period, examining team told you the inventory sold that they lost or customer bankrupt or company bankrupt. Okay, so if that's the case then you will say to yourself, right, this is the adjusting event. So first point, this is the adjusting event because Customer declared bankruptcy. First point. Second point, we will need to adjust this event in year one. That's it. But you can further go on to say that to reduce the receivables if a customer declared bankruptcy or write off the inventory. That's it. Two points, absolutely enough there. Non-adjusting event, if you see in the exhibit related to fire or some of the bad weather and even flood or dividend or shares stuff that happening, so for example declared after the year end that we want to uh, distribute dividend to shareholders or perform share issues after the year end, non-adjusting. That's your first point. The second point is that we need to disclose this event in year one, that's it. Of course, regarding disclosure, you need to disclose what is the amount and the amount, okay, and the timing. That's it. Right, that's the IS number 10. If you see in the past exam question that, okay, uh, how the customer gone into liquidation affecting our financial statement and implication for that. As I said before, the step number one in there, customer liquidation, yes, you've seen that, that's an example of what? Adjusting event. Implications, yes, we need to adjust the year one's account, so for example, to write off the receivables value, okay, in the year one's account, that's it. Do you need to write too many paragraphs in there? Well, the answer for that is no. From my perspective, my view is that two points, absolutely nothing there. 
Now another question I will leave you to say we've studied that, okay, and compare with the official answer here. Moving on. IA60, property plant equipment. Now we've covered I2 inventory, which means some things that we would like to sell it. Okay. However, if you change that to ICE number 16, which means the International Accounting Standards number 16, for the property plant equipment or PEPE, property related to land and buildings, plant related to factory, equipment related to computers and uh, all sorts of other machines. The aim is not to sell it, because the aim is to use it by the business. But we are using the historical costs, same as what we've seen in inventories. Of course, just a caveat here, or disclaimer here. I'm not saying that all the bits and pieces will be exactly the same in eyes number two inventory. Because in my course, in the OCS, I aim to help you to pass the OCS exam with my extensive experience. So therefore, I know the habit of the OCS examining team that will test this standard on the basis, level, not in depth. So therefore, you can remember the exact same stuff in the PPNA. Sort of costs that need to be expensed in the PPNA will include things like marketing, repair, maintenance, insurance and even the training costs. So make sure that if you're seeing those words, which are not related to the purchase price, not related to installation, not related to delivery, it's highly likely that we need to expense them directly for the very first time when we purchase it. Of course, in ICE number 16, when we purchase the PPE, we use the term called acquire rather than to purchase something. Later on, for the ICE number 16, we can either use the cost model, which means we take costs and to minus accumulated depreciation. You need to remember that word properly. However, we can choose to use the revaluation model there, which means that we will need to use the revalued amount and to minus any new depreciation based on the revalue amount. That's it. Of course, there will be quite a few criteria in the revaluation model in the ICE number 16. But if I were you, I would like to mention the popular principle they assisted in the revaluation model, including that we will need to do it frequently. How frequent it is that we need to revalue the uh, property plant equipment, it depends. If the market price is very really volatile, yes, more frequently, for example, six months, every six months, you to engage with an expert and to put a value on that. At the same time, you need to understand the concept of each class. So which means that if you decide to use the revaluation models to, reva to revalue the property plant equipment, you need to adopt this accounting policy for each class, for whole asset within that class. You can't say that I would like to use the revaluation model for the property. For property, we've got two classes in there, land and buildings. All right, um, I would like to use the revaluation model solely for land, not for buildings. Absolutely fine there. But you can't say that I would like to revalue this piece of land, but I'd like to keep cost model for that piece of land. That is not permitted. So make sure they're ready. And of course, some of the uh, stuff 
that you need to remember is something called the revaluation reserve. So what do I mean by revaluation reserve is this. If you're trying to revalue the piece of property plant equipment, let's say from 10 to $30, the increase of $20, we cannot put that into the current year's net profit, but we need to put that directly into the reserve within equity in our statement of financial position. So make sure that you always be ready for that. Now, I would say that, yes, from my perspective, that would be absolutely nothing there. So, for example, the model answer for capitalization of expenditure, which means the first time that we assign value to the pp &E, and the revenue expenditure, which means the first time, most likely, and even later on, that we incur things like repair and maintenance to maintain the current capacity of the property plant equipment, we to put them into the PL rather than to capitalize it as the PPE value. The subsequent measurement, we don't need to quote this really, which means later on we can choose cost or evaluation model there. Uh, so this will be accounting policy for the business. And the PPE revaluation, as I said before, we to do it quite frequently, no cherry picking which means for the whole class of pp &E. Regular, which means frequently, revalue amount, we put that into the revaluation reserve, okay? So rather than directly to retain earnings, where we can use that to determine how much dividends that we need to pay to shareholders, and even the p &L, we can't do that. Now, revaluation, as I said before, yes, need not to be an annual basis. Uh, revaluation gain in the OCI, in the other comprehensive income, which means the revaluation reserve. So, revaluing existing property for the whole class, okay, and we need to depreciate that uh, based on the latest revalue amount. That's enough to pass the IFRS related to ICE number 16. Now if you see in the past exam how this topic was tested, so are you aware that our city bicycle is very successful and we are making more permanent decisions regarding our production arrangement? The factory we are currently uh, renting is up for sale and I think we can negotiate the price. Okay for free, which I believe will be two for buildings. Uh, this is nothing to do with the ICE number 16 at all. It should be able to complete the purchase as a result, entitled to a refund one to five on the annual rental that we already paid. Okay, so simply debit receivables and possibly credit income. Now, firstly, whether it would be possible to offset the rent refund against the cost of factory? Of course, the answer is no. Secondly, understands the annual depreciation charge of the purchasing of the factory building and the land that is built on, which means that for the factory building, we need to depreciate that. So either using straight line method or the reducing balance method, straight line method will result in the same depreciation expense each year, but for balancing, uh, which means reducing balance method, there will be more depreciations to be charged in the early years and less depreciations to be charged in later years. For land, of course, never depreciate land. Thirdly, Interesting accounting implications of revaluing the factory on an annual basis. I need to touch on how the revaluation principles, I mean, I've listed three principles in, and you can say them in the exam. Of course, and that's related to this question. Now, another one, okay, I will leave you to say we'll study that on your own. Moving on, the next accounting standard. IAS number 36, impairment 
of non-current oxide or impairment of oxide. Now, this standard, from my perspective, is huge. However, the examining team only needs you to understand the basis behind this accounting standard. If I were you, if I'm required to state the general requirement of the impairment of asset, firstly, I will need to see that whether or not there will be indicators indicating that the asset could be impaired. It could be the internal indicator, for example, the asset is damaged, or the external indicator, for example, somebody else is affecting our business profitability. So for example, competitors emerge in the marketplace, forcing us not being able to operate in this country. Alternatively, the laws published by the government and requiring our businesses to leave this country. So these are sort of indicators that we need to care about. Once we've got that indicator, the next thing is we need to perform the impairment review test. Now what do I mean by impairment review test is where simply we compare the carrying value of the pp e with the recoverable amount. Now, I've touched on the recoverable amount when we talk about inventory. Recoverable amount is the way that we utilise the asset so we can get the cash flows to cover the cost that we purchased that uh, asset before. In the ice number 36 there, we need to use the higher of these two. Either will be the value in use, which means if I were to use this asset on a continuous basis, it will be the present value of generating cash profit from using that asset. Alternatively, we will be using the fair value minus disposal cost. Very similar to the net realizable value. However, we don't use the NRV here, but we use fair value or FV, so which means we need to consider the market price rather than our own selling price. I mean, our own selling price, for example, for this pen, I wish to sell it at $1 million. So I can determine my NRV, net realizable value, is more of the entity's decision. Technically, we call it as the entity specific. However, fair value is more of a market specific. So, for example, how much that the competitor is putting up the selling price on this pen, and we will use that as the fair value. And of course, if the carrying value is higher than the recoverable amount, I would say that there will be impairment. So all we need to do is to recognize the impairment expense and to reduce our current year's profit. And even to write down our asset value, and that's it. If your answer covers this aspect, I must say that no problem for that whatsoever. And of course, Particularly for goodwill, if you acquire another business, they pay more than you should, resulting in the goodwill, which will be the amounts that you overpay to another business, the goodwill will be an example of the intangible asset. Now, goodwill needs to be having the impairment review tests annually. Okay, so make sure that you're ready. There are a couple of uh, model answers that I prepared for you. Firstly, talking about indicator, talking about the review tests, talking about the value in use is just to be to discount the future cash flows to use this asset. And of course, we are not talking about the NRV here, but uh, the fair value minus the disposal costs here. And of course, the difference will be charging that to the p and as the impairment loss expense. If for any asset which has been revalued before, which means 
we have got the revaluation reserve recognised before, but now impaired. The step one is to reduce the original revaluation reserve with the balancing figure we charged up to the expense. Okay, so that's important. As I said, for goodwill, we need to be having the impairment review tests annually. For other cash generating unit, but for this paper, you can think about it as the separate product line within that business. So for each of the product line, we'll need to consider the impairment review tests on a product line and product line basis. So mainly to reduce the management work. There will be a couple of questions that you can practice on, but I would say that for the IFRS related questions not particularly linked with the pre seen or the unseen material on the exam day, you need to be absolutely clear about the IFRS achievement, otherwise can't pass this paper. So for example, please advise me what actions that we need to take to comply with the requirements of ICE number 36 impairment regarding the carrying value of the know-how. Alright, so it seems that the know-how is an example of a non-current asset, so which means the intangible asset here. Firstly, we'll need to see that whether or not we've got the impairment indicator and stating how the impairment review test should be done. Okay, simple as that. Now, before we move any further, I would like to stop here. And the next section onwards, we'll be covering other IFRS in much more detail. I look forward to seeing you then. Bye bye. APC, accounting for your future.